let's let's just settle this right now, Jack. Yeah. David Einhorn, release the detailed internal trading documents and release who was given attribution for these trades. Jack, would you agree that if in an internal trading document, James Fishback and James Fishback alone was given full attribution for these macro trades, then he was the one who ran these macro trades, yes or no? Forward Guidance is brought to you by Van Eck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about a Van Eck ETF later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. The interview you're about to watch is unlike anything you've ever seen on Forward Guidance. It concerns an ongoing legal battle between my guest today, James Fishback, and his former employer, Greenlight Capital, concerning his title and role in Greenlight's macro returns. James describes his title as, quote, head of macro, which Greenlight challenges. I asked James very rigorous questions and asked for evidence rather than accepting his claims at face value. Nowhere in this interview did I endorse or reject James's claims that he was or wasn't the head of macro. Needless to say, views expressed by James in this interview are solely his own and do not necessarily reflect the views of me, my employer, institution, or other associated parties. Rather than telling you what to think, I leave it to you, the viewer, to draw your own conclusions. And now, a glimpse into the drama that has captivated the world of high finance. An extremely special episode today. I am joined by James Fishback of Azoria Partners. James, welcome to Forward Guidance. Well, thanks, Jack. Pleasure to be here. I'm glad to be speaking with you, James. We're recording the early evening of May 22nd. And are we going to be talking about the Fed minutes that came out today? No. Are we going to be talking about NVIDIA earnings that came out uh, about around an hour or so ago? No. We are going to be talking about something which uh, really has taken the institutional investment world by storm, which is a, I think it is fair to say, dispute between you and your former employer, Greenlight Capital, uh, well-known, run and started by David Einhorn. And your claim that you were, your role there was the head of macro and mm -hmm. Greenlight's claim that you were not the head of, of macro. So I'm glad that you're here to hear your side of the story. Tell, tell us your, your story. What, what happened? What happened that led to this? Yeah, well, it's a almost don't even know where to begin with all of this. I was a consultant for David Einhorn for two years while I was running my own hedge fund called Macrovoyant. Before that, I dropped out of college. I got $15 million to run a macro fund after sophomore year. I did that for five years. And then in the spring of 2019, to use a term that Gen Z likes to use, I slid into David Einhorn's DMs on Bloomberg and suggested a Fed funds futures trade idea in line with what was happening with the mid-cycle adjustment that ended up happening in the summer of 2019, where the Fed cut at the July meeting, September meeting, and October meeting. So I reached out, pitched him a trade idea. To his credit, he took me up on it. He put the trade on. A couple weeks later, he made, I think it was about $2 million on the trade. And that began a relationship where he was paying me to generate structure and share asymmetric macro opportunities with him that he was then putting on in his fund at Greenlight. So we did that for 2019. Things got really interesting in 2020 when the pandemic hit. I went from talking him to him maybe twice a month to several times a week, sharing ideas, sharing feedback on what I was seeing. And uh, to tell you the truth, it wasn't just a working relationship, it was a friendship. And I, uh, I considered it, David, to be a friend. At the end of 2020, he offered me a job. And uh, I took it, of course. I am a, more than anything, I'm a a kid of a working class background. I grew up in South Florida. Mom's an immigrant. Dad was a city bus driver for 10 years, dropped out of college. And so I was running a fund. I was having fun with it. But to work for someone I looked up to, like David Einhorn, I read his letters in college. It was, um, it was a really awesome opportunity. So I took it. I joined the firm in early 21 as a analyst. Uh, shocker, that's the big scandal. I was uh, hired as an analyst. And I went from running my hedge fund as a PM to working as an analyst for David, uh, sharing, generating, structuring these macro opportunities. I was then giving trading authority in the fall of 21. And then after a insane, and I, I think I can call it that, an insane 2022 for macro performance for Greenlight, uh, I was given more responsibilities, more autonomy. And uh, that term head of macro is, is really where that started. And so here we are today. I left in August of 23 to start my new fund, Azoria Partners. I'm really excited about that. And I was shocked that 
the day that I left, I was put a letter in front of me that says, you know that $300,000 that you owe us because you borrowed against your collateral on the fund? Well, we are going to extend that loan, $300,000 of financial reward for you and loan forbearance on the explicit condition that once you leave here, you never refer to yourself to anything other than a former research analyst. My investors reached out to them to want to get confirmation that I was who I said I was, that my responsibilities and my contributions were what I said they were. And time and again, they were told, no, he was not. He did not. They downplayed and they misled. To tell you the truth, that's my opinion um, from what I saw. And, uh, and here we are today. Um, so it's, it's, this has really been, I, I've been quiet about this for the better part of a year. It started the day that I left. I've been trying to quietly resolve it. We were both invited on a podcast to have a spirited debate, a lively debate about Tesla, the Fed, passive versus active investing. And uh, I encouraged David to participate. And that's when he sent the tweet that some are calling the tweet heard around the world where I was, uh, you know, never did any research in my life, this, that, and the other. And I think that's how we got into this predicament. Yes. And so by the fall of 2023, uh, you had a suit, a lawsuit against Greenlight in the Supreme Court of the New York County. And they, Greenlight, had a lawsuit against you in the Southern District of, of New York. So let's just wind yeah. back the clock to 2021. So you were, you were hired in early 2021, and your title was what? Was analyst. So my offer letter was analyst. Now, I, I want to kind of correct the thing of mis- Analyst or research analyst? I, I, I don't know. I, I'd have to go check. It was one or the other. But I, I want to make clear there's no distinction at Greenlight. Uh, everybody who's an analyst is a research analyst. Anybody, there's no, there's no, there's just one type of analyst. So when we hear analyst, Jack, we think, I think a lot of people think Goldman Sachs right out of Notre Dame working on the desk, you know, uh, calling people left, right, and center. The analyst at Greenlight, there was six of us, and several of them had MBAs from Ivy League schools, and many of them were, I think I was the youngest by a decade. And so when we say analyst at a hedge fund, that is very different than a right out of college analyst working at Morgan Stanley on the commodity trading's desk. And so that I think is a big misperception. I was hired as an analyst. I was previously a PM uh, right before I joined Greenlight. And, uh, and that's how it started in February of 21. In February of 2021. And in your lawsuit against Greenlight, you say you were previously employed by Greenlight, beginning as a research analyst, then as a trader, and finally as its head of macro. Can you describe your journey through Greenlight and I mean, it sounds like you, based on research analyst to trader and then head of macro, it sounds like you got promoted twice. Is, is that what you would say? That's exactly right. And my, you know, my history, I want to be careful to not divulge anything confidential. Everything I've spoken about is in the open, whether it's in lawsuits or uh, it's, it's whatever the case may be. But I joined in February 8th of 2021 as an analyst, and I think I did a pretty good job, hit the ground running. Uh, David referred to the macro performance in 2022 in their annual letter as the best ever. And certainly the numbers internally were reflective of that, not just in terms of dollars, but in terms of risk adjusted returns. You'll have to remember that uh, when I was there, Greenlight, and this is all public information, Greenlight was not a member of the National Futures Association. They were not registered as essentially a macro hedge fund. And so that meant that they could only invest 5% of their assets in the types of trades that I would do. And so when numbers like $100 million are mentioned as profits that I generated, that was generated on, let's just hypothetically say Greenlight is a billion dollar fund. If 5% of a billion dollars is 50 million, which is what the macro denominator would have been, that's only as much as could have been allowed, then you're generating $100 million of profit on $50 million of capital. That's pretty darn impressive. I have I have the returns uh, from that letter that you referenced. We'll, we'll get into that in, in a moment. But can you describe how did you learn that you were promoted? Like who told you you were promoted and how, how did that happen? Let's start from from research analyst to trader and then then from trader to head of macro. Yeah, so in both cases, these were fairly informal promotions. Uh, Greenlight is a very small firm. It's 33 people in total, like I said, six on the investment team. And so people would give, be given new responsibilities pretty much on a whim. When I was promoted to trader, I was now given trading authorization. I was now told, hey, uh, 
you can do X, Y, Z. Again, I don't want to get into too much detail to violate my confidentiality. But when when you're promoted at a hedge fund like Greenlight, it's not like they bring out a cake with balloons and mm-hmm. send your mom a big letter home. It was, here's new responsibility and here's how you carry that out. And and here's a new title. I've been promoted before, you've been promoted before. They typically yeah. have a letter that says, this is your new title. Your t- It was title A and now it's title B. Yeah, no, ne- never got a letter in either case. Okay. Never got a letter, but got got the increased responsibilities. And of course, as you saw in that email in the lawsuit, Daniel Reutman, the chief executive officer, referring to me as the head of macro, being registered for a conference to be on a macro panel at the Global City Global Equities Conference as the head of macro. Uh, again, if I had my company email right here with all of the emails, all the examples I was referred to as the head of macro, that would be, I, I'd have access to it and I could share that. I think the bigger thing here, Jack, is everyone wants to get caught up on a title. And to be fair, that's exactly how this started. But the bigger question here is who is responsible for Greenlight's insane macro performance? The title is part of that. But the crux of this debate, of this dispute, is is David responsible or am I responsible for what Greenlight did in macro over those three years? Who do you say is responsible? I, I know the truth. And I encourage David to release the detailed internal trading ledgers that show the answer to that question. Okay, so you you are correct that in uh, the 2022 letter, uh, he says it was the best macro year ever. Gross returns for that year for the entire fund were 42.3%, net 36.6%. The macro gross returns were 5.7%, I presume as the net returns were, were smaller than that. So let's just say, just comparing the gross, 5.7 to 42.3. I'm, I'm really being honest when I say I'm not very good at math, but that is around 12 to 15% of the return. So I think in a lot of people's minds, Greenlight Capital is not a macro fund. Sure. And so it's fair to say that macro was a small percentage of Greenlight's returns. By definition, it had to be, Jack. Mm-hmm. It had to be a small percentage because of that regulatory limit, that CFTC 413 de minimis exemption, which says that if you are not operating as a commodity pool, in effect, a macro hedge fund, you cannot invest any more than 5% of your capital in macro derivatives, interest rate futures, swaps, et cetera. And so absolutely. Got it. And so you do say that over the time period you were employed, you helped generate $100 million in in trading profits. Tell us about those profits. I cannot, if David gives me permission, I'll be happy to talk about exactly what trades contributed to that. You can look in the public letters about the types of trades that were were referenced. Interest rate futures tied to the path of the Fed in 2022 is one example in that 2022 letter, along with uh, inflation swaps and a number of other instruments. But again, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk in detail about exactly the trades that I put on, but I would need David Einhorn to give me permission first. Got it. When did you first consider yourself to be the head of macro? When did I first consider that to be the case? This would have been in early 2023. Again, it is, you come into the office. I didn't, I worked remotely. So I wasn't coming in. I probably went to the office only a total of eight, nine times my entire three years there. And I was in an analyst meeting with all of the other analysts and everyone on the investment team and David terms and what does our head of macro think? And then a couple of weeks later, I'm introduced to investors at the Robinhood conference as the head of macro. And then I'm signed up for a conference as the head of macro. And this just becomes a running title within the firm that isn't just a title because, hey, how's, how's, how's it going, our macro guru? This was also a title that corresponded with increased responsibilities, increased ability to take risk, and so on and so forth. And so I think that's the big thing to consider here isn't just what the title is for itself. It's also de facto, what does the title represent? If I wasn't running the macro book, Jack, who on earth was? Was David? I, well, I would I would leave it to your listeners to, to answer that question. I've been doing multi-asset macro derivatives trading now for close to 10 years. I have run a macro fund. I have thought a lot about this. And so when you think about this massive increase in macro performance in 2022, coinciding with me joining the firm in 2021, I think that would leave listeners to make an inference that would be sound. You know, David's, David's a brilliant investor when it comes to stock picking. You know, he and I have a disagreement about Tesla, and uh, I've made that clear publicly. That's why I encouraged him to join this debate that we were both invited to. But when it comes to macro, when it comes to the type of exotic derivatives that Greenlight was involved in, when it comes to the types of interest rate derivatives that were referenced in those letters, it's pretty clear that only one person 
would have uh, would have been in a position to run that type of complicated macro book. You say the word exotic. When I think of exotic, I think of things that no one really trades anymore. They only existed like before the great financial crisis. I mean, things like variant swaps just are traded. Things like things that have really weird names that I like. I would not say shorting Fed funds futures or buying a SOFR call op or put option is exotic. When you say exotic, how exotic are we talking about? Uh, well, let me just speak in, in general terms. I don't want to reference anything I did at Greenlight, but when I think exotic derivatives, I would say second uh, gen FX exotic options, second gen interest rate exotic options, all OTC. I would think okay. variant swaps. I would think volatility swaps on FX fall, variants on equity index fall uh, in the sort. Okay. So those are those are exotic. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, certainly a Fed funds futures contract or a, a SOFR put tree is not an exotic option. But nonetheless, it's still part of a, a, a macro book. Was this head of macro ever referenced in, in writing? And did you ever get a, a formal promotion letter that changed your title from research analyst to head of macro? I didn't get a formal promotion letter in either of my promotions to trader or to head of macro. And both were, were met with increased responsibilities. These were referenced internally and externally. And uh, that's how it went. When did you learn that you were the head of macro? Because you must have heard that term originally. Yeah. For, 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 for the first time. When, when did you first say, I'm the head of macro? Look, I, I don't remember the exact date. Maybe they should have given me an offer letter when they promoted me to trader and when they promoted me to head of macro. I, I, I don't have an exact date for you. And I think the bigger question here is twofold. One, if I weren't, if I wasn't the head of macro, who on earth was? Two, who was responsible for Greenlight's insane macro performance? And third and finally, Jack, and this is the most important one, why do you go to your employee on the, their last day of employment and say, we're going to offer you $300,000 in loan forbearance? I published this document online, mm -hmm. $300,000 in loan forbearance on the explicit condition that you do not refer to yourself as anything but a former research analyst. Let's actually talk about the cease and desist letters I've gotten since the fall as well. I got one letter in October of 2023, Jack, that said that I was defaming Greenlight because my Twitter bio read, quote, James ran macro investing. And so this isn't some beef about head of macro. I know everybody wants to talk about head of macro this. They literally threatened to take me to federal court because my Twitter bio said that I ran macro investing. They don't want to give me any credit whatsoever in the smallest of terms for the insane contributions I brought to the table. And my question is why? Why can't they just tell the truth? What they say is that you are appropriating their, their performance. But I just want to get the facts on that your official title, if regardless of what everyone thinks or what people say sure. on Zoom calls, but your official title, if we were to open up the Greenlight HR document, was still research analyst. There was no letter saying you've been promoted from research letter to head of macro. It was informal. There is no Greenlight HR document. There was no Greenlight HR department. There was nobody who worked in HR. It's a very small firm. I can tell you that I was promoted to trader. I got nothing in writing. I got no new offer letter. I got no increase in compensation. I just got trading authorization. Then I was promoted to head of macro and nothing of the sort, no balloons, no offer letter, no bonus, none of that. And so I think people have to recognize that Greenlight is one of the smallest hedge funds in this universe. Had I worked at point 72, I think it'd be different. I think I would have gotten an actual offer letter and it would have been codified in some HR documents. But people have to recognize that if I wasn't the head of macro, if I wasn't contributing, why on earth are they coming after me as hard as they are? Here's the thing, Jack. I gave a lecture at the University of Florida. I gave a podcast interview at the University of Florida, both earlier this year. The University of Florida was served with a cease and desist letter by Greenlight's lawyers saying, take down the podcast and take down the social media posts of James Fishback because he is making statements and your students in effect are making statements that are harmful to green light. They are going all out, contacting every podcast, conference, university that I've spoken at, trying to purge this title and association with green light. And that is wrong. So there's no uh, HR department at, at green light is, is what you're saying. But if someone had been pro other people who are promoted, were they, did they normally get an, an offer letter? And was there normally a process by which that was recognized in writing? Not, not to my knowledge, no. Not to my knowledge. I, I can only speak, I was only there for three years. There are folks who were there for 10 or 15 years. 
Uh, I was very clearly promoted on two occasions and never got an updated offer letter. That's a question to ask them. Why didn't they do the proper paperwork? I just knew I came in on Monday and I had new responsibilities. And honestly, Jack, I had never worked anywhere before in my life. I went off to Georgetown. I did that for two years. I got $15 million to start a macro fund. I did that for five years. I had never gotten a pay stub in my entire life prior to Greenlight. And so when you promote someone, I guess in hindsight, I should have demanded an offer letter, but I figured that everybody was acting in good faith. And I was, I can't even say surprised. I was totally floored and shocked that on my last day, I was put a forbearance letter in front of me that said, we're going to give you $300,000 of loan forbearance on the explicit condition that you never refer to yourself as anything other than a research analyst. My title had never been in dispute. You're a head of macro as long as you work here, but it seems like the second you leave, you are nothing to us and your contributions are meaningless. So let's talk about that loan, uh, which I have the um, amount here. It was around $346,000 in, in loans via two notes. Yeah. Tell us about how you first got to borrow money from Greenlight. What was it collateralized buy. And how common was that at Greenlight? It wasn't common at all. It was extended to me, I, I was told because of my good performance. And so I was effectively able to borrow against future bonuses and the money that had already been invested on my behalf in the fund, given bonuses that I'd been given in prior years. And so as folks know, even if you're an investor in a hedge fund, if you need money or you want to buy something, you can't pull that money out. And so when uh, I would need you know, 50 grand or 100 grand, David would extend me a very low interest loan to be able to use that money without having to redeem my interest and I could effectively borrow against my future bonus. Yes, that, that did seem to me as uh, not, not very common. So was there ever an announcement of your promotion in Greenlight's quarterly letters? Uh, not to my knowledge. No, not to either trader or to this macro position, neither one. Is it, is it accurate to say that typically promotions are announced in green light quarterly letters? I would say it is accurate, which leads me to believe why did they not acknowledge this publicly? Why, you know, and maybe the truth of the matter, Jack, and I don't want to speak for them. I don't want to make assumptions, but maybe they were embarrassed in a sense that a Someone with a high school degree, no more and no less, was coming in and was running a macro book. And to give that person public credit and plaudits through promotions and through accolades would draw questions from investors. I don't know, but I, I do find it very strange there was this double standard in many senses about how I was treated as opposed to different employees. So in your two promotions, one from research analyst to trader, one from trader to head of macro. You're saying that neither of those came with a letter and neither of those came with an increase in pay, but they did come with an increase in responsibilities. That's correct. An increase in responsibilities. And more than anything, here's the most important thing is it was acknowledged by management, both internally and externally going to the Robin hood conference and being introduced to ultra high net worth individuals and family offices as the head of macro, and then sitting and having a cocktail with somebody for 45 minutes about what the forward path of inflation and the Fed path was going to look like. And so it was when it was convenient for me to be the head of macro, when they wanted me to be the head of macro, when I was doing things for them and I was working there, I was the head of macro. And when it was time to leave, guess what? Here's your financial incentive, go away. And that's, that's a really messed up thing. This is a bigger story than just a title. It's a story really, I think, about fairness and about trust. And again, I, I remind you that cease and desist letter that was sent by Aiken Gump to me in October of 2023, their last contention with me wasn't that I was using the head of macro title, but that I was merely saying that I ran macro investing at Greenlight. So I'm not allowed to use the title, Jack. I'm not allowed to talk about my responsibilities. I'm not allowed to talk about my contributions. And I'm sure as heck not allowed to have my track record. That makes things pretty hard when it's time to go build Azoria over the next year. Forward Guidance is brought to you by Van Eck. The Van Eck Morningstar Wide Moat ETF, ticker MOAT, has outperformed the S&P 500 for over a decade. How? Moat strives to achieve a simple but challenging task. 
buy quality stocks when they're undervalued and sell them when they're overvalued. Visit vanek.com slash moat FG to learn more. That's vanek.com slash moat FG. Now the disclosures. All investing is subject to risk, including the possible loss of money you invest. Visit vanek.com to carefully read a prospectus before investing. The Vanek Morningstar Wide Moat ETF is distributed by Vanek Securities Corporation, a wholly owned subsidiary of Vanek Associates Corporation. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. When you say you ran macro investing, how would you define running macro investing? That's a great question. So here's how I define macro investing, and here's how I define running it. Researching, generating, structuring, executing, risk managing, and taking profits on macro trades. What about deciding? In what sense? Deci- let's do this or let's not do that. That is... Ultimately, a decision that is left to David. David obviously has the final say on anything that's in the book. In any case, and there were situations where there were things that we had agreed on that I came in one morning and that had been trimmed. David, it's it's a single man operation. It's a David Einhorn show. Everyone recognizes that. And so, of course, David Einhorn is the president. He's the founder. He's the CEO. He has ultimate discretion about what is and what is not in the book. So... Describe the process by which you would do a trade. You'd say, oh, I saw, I've been doing some work on oil, or the Fed has been saying this, the interest rate curve is strong. I see an opportunity here. You would then go to David. David would say yes, tell you to do the trade. I'll, I'll give you just an example of how this would work. We would look at um, a Fed meeting, for example, and we would say, we think there is a chance that the forward guidance at this meeting is going to change what the next six months of Fed pricing looks like. So I would do the research on that. I would generate the idea itself. I would structure that idea. Some of the markets you mentioned, Fed funds, futures, SOFR, OIS, one year, one year, whatever the case may be. I would then take that idea. That idea would get cleared and I would go and execute that idea in the marketplace. Risk management, come back, and then we'd have a conversation about taking profits. And did you ever put on trades that David didn't know about and didn't authorize you to do? No, David David knew about everything. David was intimately involved in every trade, in every aspect of the portfolio. And of course, he was, he was, he ran the show. So I came to David on everything. We had conversation, probably spoke almost every single day, even though I was a, a remote employee. I think one thing that's interesting Jack, for for your viewers, is there were six folks on the investment team, many of them, like I said, 10 to 15 years older than me. And I was the only one who had the ability to go out and trade in the marketplace. And I took that. I, I always conferred with David, Jack, because I valued his feedback. I valued what he was thinking about and how it might fit into other parts of the portfolio. So for example, if we were making a rates trade at the time and he had some view on tech or industrials or defensives, he might want to size that trade in a different way than had he not had that exposure on. And so I always went to him for advice, for feedback about how we were going to precisely size these things. And I valued his input in that process. You said you valued his input. Yeah. But wasn't it your input that he was using because he was the one making the decisions or y- you were making decisions? When you say making the decisions, what do you mean? Deciding what goes on. You, know, you come to Dave, David, David likes the idea, you do it. He doesn't like the idea, you don't do it. Yeah. I mean, that's the case in, in any, I think in, in any situation is that if the founder and the CEO of a hedge fund does not like an idea, it will not get into the book. Right. But okay, I have, unlike you, I have zero experience at uh, hedge funds, but I think sure. that in the multi-pod model, uh, you know, if, if some portfolio manager wants to be, go long calls on S&P 500, he's not going to Ken Griffin. And so he's running his book as opposed to someone who maybe works for him who says, we should do this, we should do that. And then he makes that decision. Do you, do you do you see the word running suggests command and authority? I don't know that it suggests command and authority. I think if you run a restaurant, you still defer to the owner of the restaurant if you're going to change the menu, right? Uh, I deferred to David both out of respect and out of the institutional setup of Greenlight Capital, which is not a multi-manager hedge fund. It is a single uh, key man operation. Yes, uh, but it has multiple strategies. And 
Do, do you think if, let's say, in 2022, Greenlight made the wrong bets and they were down 20% in their, in their macro position, who do you think would have been blamed for that? I would have been. Maybe internally, but people, people would have viewed it as David because David was the one making, making decisions based on what, 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 you're, what you're saying. Look, I, I want skin in the game. I've always wanted that. I've always valued that. And that, if that means I lose money, I lose money. If I make money, I make money. But I should only uh, be given the recognition if I, in fact, deserved that recognition. If I didn't, then I'm the person to blame because I'm the person who's generating these ideas, structuring them, risk managing them, executing them, and, and doing that uh, under David. So absolutely. Just to be clear, he, he was still the one saying, Let's do this. Let's not do that. No, you could have come to him with an idea that wouldn't have worked, and he said no to that. So he does. He does have some contribution. When you say to the macro book, absolutely. And so, but that—that's the biggest thing here, Jack. Is that that's not even in dispute. No one is disputing that. I'm not disputing that. Of course, David deserves some credit. He's the one who hired me. He's the one who gave capital to the strategy. He's the one who really thought about what macro would mean within the green light operation. I'm not trying to take credit away from David. And I reject the notion that, that, this, that this is really about one versus the other. This is about them taking everything back, putting a document and saying, you want 300 grand here, but don't you ever refer to your responsibilities or your title. This is about them going to a public university and demanding that university in turn demand their students to take down a podcast with me, a podcast Jack, just like you and I are having right now, because in that 45 minute podcast, I referred to myself as the head of macro. And I, I leave you with this kind of one thing on this particular point is if I wasn't the head of macro, why did they keep calling me the head of macro? Let's talk about the instances of when they called you uh, head of macro. You said at the Robinhood conference, they called you that. They said on Zoom calls. What are the instances where Greenlight employees referenced to you as the head of macro. I'm aware of one instance where that happened in an email, but how how common was that? What 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 evidence do you have? You know, in terms of written records. Oh well, if I don't have my access to my company email, if I did, we could we could produce them up the wazoo, right? This was not even in dispute. It's like saying, how often do people call you James? How often do people call you Fishback? I was the head of macro. They called me the head of macro. I didn't think twice about not an offer letter, about not an increase in pay when I was upgraded to trader and when I was then upgraded to head of macro. So you said, it, how, how often do people refer to you as, as James? There was one instance of a letter from... Dan Reutman, I believe is his name. In this email, uh, he refers to you as a head of, of macro. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that was Dan Reutman trying to get you into a GLG conference or interview with a Fed, a Federal Reserve official. Is that the accurate circumstances? I, I, you don't have to try to get anybody into a GLG event. Uh, we're, it's a paid service. Greenlight pays to be a part of that network. And so we are allowed to go to those events, whether okay. you're the head of Macro or whether you're the intern who's in high school. There was no need for them to uh, inflate my title to get me into a GLG Zoom call with Eric Rosengren, of, formerly of the Boston Fed. Okay, that's a good point. So that is an instance of the, I believe he's the chief operating officer of, of Greenlight, referring to you yeah. as a head of macro. Are there any other written records where other green light people, i.e. not you, refer to you as that? Not that I have access to, uh, but discovery is going to be fun, Jack. Discovery is okay. going to be a lot of fun. We're going to find out a lot of stuff, stuff that I don't even know about, about how exactly this went down and why it went down. And again, this title was not in dispute up until I said, hey guys, I'm going to leave. I'm going to do what David did in his late 20s. I'm going to start my own hedge fund. It was really nice knowing you. Boom, here's a letter, $300,000 of loan forbearance on the explicit condition that you never refer to yourself as anything but a research analyst. And then within 45 days, I'm being served cease and desist letters. Jack, I want to point out one thing real quick. What is the difference between suing someone for defamation successfully and unsuccessfully? There's one big difference. I don't and know. And that is... That is I can go out anywhere, anytime and criticize anybody. And it's not defamation so long as I'm telling the truth. 
It's been eight months since Greenlight threatened in a written cease and desist letter to sue me for defamation for referring to myself as the head of macro and running macro investing. Why haven't they sued me? Why haven't they taken me to court on that charge of defamation for using a title that allegedly is not mine? The reason why they have not filed that case is because it is not defamatory to tell the truth. Uh, I believe that is the case. Unlike in the UK, it is not defamatory to tell the truth. And I'm, I'm glad, you know, you and I live in a country where the truth is not defamatory. And actually in a video where you said, dear, on Twitter, you posted, dear David Einhorn. And then that's all, the only words you said that you posted a video. It ended with, uh, I care about the truth. My message to David is this. I have a lot of respect for you. I learned a lot working at Greenlight for three years. We made a lot of money together. If you want to compete, let's compete. Don't use your lawyers to email the University of Florida as you did to email conference, conferences and my friends and my partners and threaten to sue them if they so much as have me on a panel as the head of macro. Don't do that. Let's just cut this out. Let's compete. Let me start Azoria. Let me start my hedge fund. You run your hedge fund. And let's circle back in a couple of years and see where our performance is. Nothing about currently being in litigation prevents you or me from telling the truth. So you should, you should respond to this video, David. You should, because the truth is all that matters. I'm glad that we are doing some truth discovery here. So you said, so there are, you think in the green light servers, there are other emails that refer to you as head of macro, not just this oh, one from Daniel Reutemann. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, Jack, if I would have known they were going to pull this crap, I would have recorded everything. I would have recorded. I would have taken screenshots of every last email. I would have recorded David, head of macro this, head of macro that. No, of course. But I, I come in. I'm this naive kid, right? I, I'm a, I'm a, all I have is a high school degree. I was running a hedge fund for five years. I got $15 million to drop out of college. I come work for David Einhorn. I'm just kind of happy to be there. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing this macro stuff. 2020 happens, 2021 happens. And if I would have known they were going to pull these shenanigans, and that's what they are, they're shenanigans, then of course I would have documented everything. But that's why the United States has a court system. That's why that court system allows for discovery. And I look forward to those documents coming to light in that, in that process. I mean, I saw it on Twitter, but how do we get yeah. access to the letter from Dan Reutemann in the GLG thing where he referred to you as head of macro? That was filed in my public lawsuit as evidence uh, of that particular uh, use of the term. And did you file that after you left? Uh, yeah, so I filed that after I had one of my investors reach out to Greenlight. It's about to invest $10 million, a preeminent family office was going to invest $10 million in Azoria. And just as due diligence was coming to an end, they had forgot to do a basic reference check. That's just mm -hmm. kind of trust but verify, right? Mm -hmm. You you want to hey, this? He says you worked at Greenlight. Everyone knows you worked at Greenlight, but let's just do it because we have to do it because that's our SOP. Send an email to Dan Reutman, and they ask, "Hey, we want to confirm what was his responsibilities? What was his exact this, that, and the other?" And then Dan Reutman shoots back and says, "He wasn't the head of macro. We never had a head of macro at Greenlight." And so that investor. I can, I guess, understand why they did what they did because I was effectively being called a liar. They did not end up investing, costing me a $10 million investment in my new fund. And that's where we said, look, when you lie and you cause damages and you do it in such a way, then that is defamation. And that's why we filed this suit. And again, I want to remind your listeners, if I am lying about my title, mm -hmm. they have the resources to sue me any day now. It's been eight months since they've threatened to sue me for defamation for calling myself the head of macro. That's what the cease and desist letter says, two of them. These are the same people who have sent cease and desist letters to podcasts, to universities saying, don't have him, don't have him. But they've yet to sue me, the alleged culprit. They've yet to sue me for defamation. Why, Jack? Because for to sue someone for defamation, they have to have said something false. And there's nothing false about me being the head of macro and me running macro investing at Greenlight Capital. Uh, so... If you filed the the uh, whatever suit, uh, I actually don't know what it is. But but with with evidence of the email from Daniel Reutemann referring to you as head of macro, if you filed that when you had already left Greenlight Capital, how do you have access to, the, to that email? So I had access to that email because I took a screenshot of it right before I left. But you didn't take screenshots of other emails where you were referenced to as head of macro. 
No, because this was this was self-evident. I mean, I, I'm not going to sit there and go through every last email. This was an email that I had recently gotten that had recently come up because Dan Reutman was talking about it. I, I screenshotted that email. Again, I trust the court process. I trust what discovery is going to bring up. Again, if you know the way we're we're approaching us from a legal standpoint is when you call someone something, that's who they are, especially if you publish it externally and the whole world sees it. In this case, you have someone from an external uh, firm seeing it. Again, you don't call someone the head of macro if they're not the head of macro. It's not some colloquialism like macro guru or macro genius or here's our macro dude, here's our macro whatever. No, head of macro is a recognized title on both the sell side and on the buy side. GLG, we were paying them to attend their events. They had no reason to inflate anything about me. It was a Zoom call with Eric Rosengren that seven or eight people were on. There's no reason for him to to lie about that or to inflate inflate my title. And there was no reason for them to refer to me as the head of macro countless times at the Robinhood conference internally when meeting with investors and so on and so forth. So you are saying that there is a countless or let's say an N number of emails and written evidence on the Greenlight server or e email server that where other people, other employees of Greenlight, perhaps David Einhorn himself, um, refer to you as the head of macro. And those existed but when you left, you took a screenshot of one instance of that, but not the other. So there are uh, N minus one that in discovery you think will strongly support your, your case. I know will support my case. And again, I, I want us to focus on what is really at stake here, Jack. I know this all started because of the head of macro title. I, I know that's how this whole thing started. This is much bigger than that. It's about who is responsible for Greenlight's macro performance in 21, 22, and 23? That's the question. And so I'll, I'll give you one particular example. I don't want to get into too much detail on this, but on the internal documents that David Einhorn can release any day now, and he hasn't, I was given full attribution for the $100 million in macro trades. So I'm actually staring, I, I can't show you, of course, but I'm staring right now at my internal trading ledger that goes through all of my trades by instrument and the profit or loss on those trades. And right at the top, it says Fishback Performance. And then in the column next to each trade, it has my initials JF, 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 JF. And so you might have a, a theory or a definition of what it means to run macro, but by Greenlight's own admission, their own internal trading documents that were used to determine my bonuses and my compensation, I was given credit for these trades and no one else. Funny enough, by the way, there are situations in which other folks at the firm were given dual credit uh, between different analysts or between David and an analyst. And on this ledger I'm looking at right in front of me, there's only one person's name, and that is mine. And not any other uh, analyst or not David? No. And I encourage David to release these documents. If I could, I would release them in a heartbeat. But David Einhorn should release, publicly release these. There's nothing to hide here. Again, this is like straight out of a Billions episode, Jack. Uh, podcasts, the university, I have student groups who are saying we can't host you anymore on campus. Podcast being deleted, rewriting history, purging my name, purging the comments and remarks that I've given, all because of this. This can't be just about a title. And that's why I want us to focus less on, well, when were you called this and what email this, that, and the other. This is not about a title. It's about who deserves credit for what happened at Greenlight Macro for those three years. Was there anyone else on the macro team besides you? No. Got it. I was hired, I was, like I said, I was, a, I was a portfolio manager of my own fund for five years. I was hired at Greenlight to do similar work that I was doing for David. I also want to remind folks, and I, we haven't talked about it yet on this interview, but I posted it on X last week. I had an investor text me a couple days ago saying, I see what's happening on Twitter. Um, I just want to let you know, when I was doing due diligence for your fund, I reached out to Greenlight and I asked them to confirm that you were a paid consultant for David. And they refused. And I asked them again, and they refused to tell me that you were a paid consultant. I was obviously a paid consultant. I've shared publicly the images of checks that say Greenlight Capital, paid to the order of James Fishback. And in the memo, get this, Jack, macro consulting. And so it's not about a title. I know that's how this started. I know this, that, and the other. That's the literally the meme uh, of what's going on. And some of them, to tell you the truth, are pretty funny. But <laughs> yeah, they, when you're, they are pretty funny. 
there, uh, when you're saying, well, he never consulted for us. He was never a macro head of macro. He never ran macro investing. He wasn't responsible for macro investing. Anything that I say is defamatory. And that's really messed up. And I, I, I urge them, I plead with them. If I am defaming you, if I am lying about my title, my contributions and my responsibilities, that would be defamation and you would have grounds to sue me. They certainly have the resources, Jack, to do that. They threatened yes. to do so on two occasions in September and October of last year, and they haven't yet. Why? Because to sue someone for defamation, they have to be telling falsehoods. So I just want to be clear. They did not say that you didn't consult for them. They merely did not confirm or deny. So that that is a, a difference. And I have seen that check of you as a consultant, and when I have no reason to to doubt it's yeah, uh, veracity. So yeah, I don't think anyone is denying that you worked in macro. No one is saying no. He was a uh, utilities analyst. You know, you you're a macro guy. Yeah, it's. I think it's the head of macro thing. And so so no one was in the macro department. I mean, David was involved. So say the p two people who did macro were you and David. I mm -hmm. think even you would say you were junior to David. Oh, I, everyone was junior. Everyone was junior to David. I know. So. <laughs> The word, don't you think the word run implies some sort of senior position? Jack, if I'm lying and I didn't run macro, they can sue me tomorrow in federal court and they haven't for eight months. I, I get what you're saying, but if I am lying, then I am defaming them and they could have every opportunity to sue me and they haven't. Why haven't they if I'm lying? I think part of it, James, is the extreme vagueness of the word the word head of macro and running macro. I think on the key facts, it sounds like what I've seen from Greenlight and they're, you know, they're, they're publicly available documents that what you're saying does not so, I mean, yeah, that David was in charge of raking, you know, discre discretionary decisions. You executed the trades. I, I think the disagreement is whether that constitutes running macro or head of macro. Do you agree with that, that a lot of the disagreement is on semantics rather than the facts. Uh, no, because I'm staring right now, again, right here at the internal performance sheet that breaks down all of my trades with a little nice little number at the end of it there. And I am the one given full attribution, fishback and my initials JF. And so you have your theory, Jack. I understand that. I'm privy to the facts here. Greenlight is privy to the fact. There's only two people really in the world that know what happened mm -hmm. here. I guess two parties, me, them and their legion of lawyers, right? And so Let's let's just settle this right now, Jack. Yeah. David Einhorn, release the detailed internal trading documents and release who was given attribution for these trades. Jack, would you agree that if in an internal trading document, James Fishback and James Fishback alone was given full attribution for these macro trades, then he was the one who ran these macro trades, yes or no? I honestly don't know. And I'll give you an example from my own experience. At a previous company I worked at, my official title was something that was not a very senior sounding title. It sounds like, as you allege, so similar to you as, as you allege, I had an outsized impact on booking very important guests. Maybe it's my arrogance to think, but maybe it's, it's, it is accurate that uh, I played a role that was a lot larger than my title suggested, but my title was still my title. Okay, but, we're, but, but you didn't answer the question, Jack, with all due mm -hmm. respect. I, yes. I asked if there are internal trading documents that give me and me alone attribution for the macro book, then who ran the macro book? So you're saying that none of the macro positions were, they were only run by you and attributed by you? I'm looking at the document right now, and my name and my name alone is on that document. So you can have your opinion about what happened, but green light, Greenlight's opinion of the facts is that on these internal documents, I was given credit for these trades. Now, Jack, I want to just back up for a second. Yeah, yeah. Why do I care about this? Yes. I don't actually care about being called the head of macro. Uh, maybe it sounds like a great pickup line. I think that's one of the memes is being able to slide into someone's DMs <laughs> and say that. I care about this, Jack, because in America, you are allowed to compete even with your billionaire ex-boss. Mm -hmm. I care about this because I am trying to start a business. I am trying to compete. I am doing what David did in his late 20s, which was leave your firm to build something new and hang your own shingle. And so when I am trying to do that, and my former employer is saying, title, no, 
Contributions, negative. Responsibilities, forget about it. The fact that you consulted, refusals. That is what we're dealing with. Refusals and to confirm or deny. Yes, yeah, problem. Well, Jack, I haven't read that. I don't know. If you, have you read that email? No, based on what I'm but, but on Twitter, but I, I, I haven't, no. Okay, so I haven't read that email. So I, I have no clue. This is coming to me from an investor who told me that they refuse to tell. Why, Jack? Yeah. Why would they refuse something that is so blatantly obvious that I was a paid consultant for David Einhorn. Why? I don't know. I, I'm not going to speculate. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you why. It's because there's some real issues here about who has the, the ability to tell and to be honest about what's going on. That's the issue here. Look, we all, I, I don't think David is happy. I don't think I would be happy if someone left my firm mid-year uh, to go do their own thing. That's that's a trope in our business, right? That, oh, mm -hmm. so-and-so left and now so-and-so is pissed off. But to do this coordinated, send cease and desist letters to every university that I've spoken at, that, that oh, I should say the University of Florida that I know of uh, so far, um, I know one, of one other major conference that has also received a cease and desist letter that says, take this down, take this down, take this down. This is not normal, Jack. And anyone pretending this is about a title is sadly mistaken. This is about purging and rewriting history about what I did at Greenlight. And I care about this for one reason, not because I want to harm David, not be, I wish him well. I wish everyone at Greenlight, well, I had a lot of friends there. I don't think they're my friend anymore, but I, I'm doing by the way, what am I doing? Actually, I, I didn't start this, right? Uh, they defamed me. I have every right to sue them. And we had a lively Twitter uh, opportunity to have a debate. And then David comes back and slaps back. And by the way, you notice what he did, Jack, he didn't say, uh, I don't want to have a debate about Tesla, because I think this is a, whatever he had, a, he shot back at me and declined by attacking my character and attacking me. And any time in a debate when you're attacking your opponent, not on their arguments or their perspective, but on who they are as a person, that is a sign that you are losing the debate. So when he did that and then said that we are involved in lawsuit, that is when I published the lawsuit. That is when I put this out there. I want to remind everybody, I have kept this very quiet. It's been spoken to no one outside of my lawyers and my family since I left in August. It's his tweet. It's his insult. It's his lie that I have never done any equity analysis. Never done any equity analysis, Jack. I was on Bloomberg Technology a couple months ago talking about my long position in Microsoft and why I think generative AI is going to be a boon for that company. And so that's how this started. I am playing defense. I am speaking truth. And I'm grateful for Elon and what X has become to be able to do that and have the reach that I've been able to have. So I'm looking at David Einhorn's tweet right now. I, I would not say if this tweet was about me, I would, I would not be ha happy with it. It's certainly, I would not call it a, a charitable email. But what do you say if you are involved in macro, that is different than uh, equities or an equity, a single single name equity, let alone Tesla. For example, the best macro investor in the world, like say John Maynard Keynes, I, although I don't think he was the best macro investor in the world, uh, you know, but like George Soros, he doesn't really have an opinion on Bank of America versus Wells Fargo, right? He has an opinion on currencies, interest rates, some commodities maybe, and how to express those trades. Stan Druckenmiller. So, so, so they, they, single stock analysis and fundamental analysis is different than macro. Of course it's different, and that's yeah. not what this tweet's about, Jack. I'm going to read the tweet for you, word okay, for yeah, word. I, I am not aware that you have ever spent any time analyzing Tesla or its fundamentals or really any other equity position for that matter. That's false. And so the test for defamation is, is it a true or false type statement? So for example, if I called Jack, you seem like a nice guy we haven't met. If I called you a douche, I would never call you that. You're a good guy. I am Thanks. a big fan of your podcast. If I called you a douche, is that defamation, Jack? Uh, no, I'd say it's a matter of opinion. It's a matter of opinion, but inherently it's a matter of opinion because I could never yeah. prove that you were a douche one way or the other. If I call someone a fraud, that is defamation because you could prove someone's a fraud. They've been charged, they've been convicted of fraud, so on and so forth. So when David says, I am not aware that you have ever spent any time analyzing Tesla or its fundamentals or really any other equity position for that matter, that is a true or false provable statement because clearly I have, it's public. I've written publicly about my position in Tesla. I talked recently about this chat GPT moment for version 12 of FSD, which is this end-to-end -end neural net, replacing 300,000 lines of C++ and having this AI-powered uh, full self-driving. 
And I've, again, done a ton of research. It's almost crazy that I would even have to defend this point. And so I want to remind everybody, there's a multi-billionaire and then there's his former employee and one is defaming the other and one is trying to stick up for himself, tell the truth and simply start a business. I say this with humility, Jack, if I were not going to start my own fund, if I were seeking a job at, let's say, 0.72 or at BlackRock or at Millennium, David's tweet would be the end of my career. David's tweet would be the end of my career. And very well, maybe the end of my career. I don't know. I don't know. This is a very damning, damning tweet to say something this false and this defamatory. And so when you're debating someone, attack the argument, don't attack the person. He then goes on to mention that I wouldn't do this because of the ongoing litigation. That's the first time the litigation has ever been mentioned publicly. And that is when I respond. And I want to be as transparent as possible. I post the full lawsuit and and folks have dissected that since. I just want, so you do agree that fundamental single stock analysis is different than macroeconomic analysis and that most of the work you did at Mac, did you ever do any work at Greenlight that was single stock analysis on individual companies? That's not what the tweet says. He doesn't, he doesn't condition it on at Greenlight, you did not do any other equity analysis or analyze Tesla. He says, I am not aware that you have ever spent any time analyzing Tesla or its fundamentals or really other or really any other equity position for that matter, period. Certainly not during the two years while you were a macro analyst at Greenlight. And so those are two separate statements. Mm -hmm. He made a blanket statement that I've never done any work on any stock in my entire life. He did do a hedge, which is, he did, you know, so you could think it's kind of a, you know, a, a, a legalistic move, but he said, I am not, I'm not aware that you have done that. Okay. So, so, it so could be we've true. done a, it's, I've done a, I've, I've thought a lot about this and obviously talked to my attorneys about this. If simply saying I'm not aware or in my opinion was giving you a way to exonerate yourself from defamation, that would be too clever for our legal system to work. Uh, in my opinion, uh, Jack is a fraud, is, is purely defamatory. You can't simply tack on some conditional statement as far as I'm aware, or I think, or in my opinion, that exonerates you and gives you the runway to defame someone from your perch as a billionaire, by the way, $15 billion fund down to $1 billion fund, a perch as a billionaire to attack your former employee. And that's the messages I've gotten. You know, a lot of these anonymous I call them dweebs on Twitter. They're this, that, and the other simping for a billionaire. The portfolio managers that have reached out to me on Bloomberg chat, we stand with you. We knew what you did at Greenlight. We were on the other side of the trade. Uh, that's really interesting. The sales trader who was quoted, I think that was in Sherwood, who said that he attested to the size and scope of what I did at Greenlight. And I got a very friendly call from a very, very, maybe maybe the best known hedge fund manager in uh, in the country. Uh, with with some interesting news and his take on what's going on here. So, you know, there's a lot of criticism in some senses, but the people that matter know exactly what is happening here. Let's talk about your decision to leave uh, Greenlight. H tell us about that process. At what point did you get the itch of, hmm, you know, maybe I'll start to go, maybe I won't. At what point did you become kind of certain, okay, I will be leaving? And when did you announce your departure? So I've always had the itch. I've always had this entrepreneurial spirit to me. I was the kid running garage sales twice a month in my neighborhood because I didn't get an allowance. Um, I, I had the itch in many respects on this front because I had run a fund myself. And what excited me most, Jack, about running my own fund is that I had skin in the game both ways. That if I failed, I failed because it was me. And if I succeeded, I succeeded because it was me. And then I got compensated accordingly. And I think that's the really big point here. I don't think I was fairly compensated uh, at Greenlight for the contributions that I brought on. And I wanted to build something where one, I could be independent. And two, I could really own the upside, really own the upside, you know, in terms of you do the math, right? 20, 25% performance allocation. Uh, if in a, you know, on the profits. And I much would prefer to do that independently than to be uh, awarded some bonus at the end of the year. But at what point did you decide, okay, I'm going to leave? At what point did I decide I was, well, so I, I resigned in early August. And how did you convey that? To in an email. David Einhorn, through email. I got it. Yeah. And how did they respond? They accepted my resignation. 
and uh, and then it was just the, the the details. I don't remember the exact uh, the back and forth, uh, but I resigned. And I, again, I made it pretty clear that you know there's a difference between having a conversation about wanting to leave. Uh, and resigning. And I think they recognized the two that this was not something I was open about having a conversation to. It wasn't framed that way. It was a, I'm resigning, period. Let's mm-hmm. talk about winding this down. Did you know that when you were leaving that you were going to start your own head fund, which you have now, Azoria Partners, Azoria Capital? I did, yes. Did you ask David Einhorn or any other people from Greenlight if they would like to invest in your hedge fund, as is sometimes often, you know, in the case of Tiger Cubs, okay, you worked for Julian Robertson, uh, you, you had a good relationship, you said, hey, Julian, uh, you know, you, you might not love to hear this, but I'm going to be leaving and launching my own fund. I'd love your blessing. I'd love for you to invest in my fund. Do I have your blessing? Did, did that, did you do that? I did not, no. Why not? So there's, there's, there's two reasons. The, 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 Greenlight Masters is their fund of funds. That's the only way that Greenlight invests in external funds. And so they've never invested in a macro fund, to my knowledge, and they certainly weren't going to make an exception this time. So uh, by the very nature of the institutional setup, they weren't suited to invest in the type of macro fund uh, that I was launching. And I'm honestly, I'm not the person who wants a handout. I'm just not Uh, sure as heck, especially after I was given this ultimatum and and told you will be, you know, punished for ever referring to yourself as anything but this BS title that you had when you were hired that had changed twice since. Right. But the decision of should I go to Greenlight and say, do you want to invest? Do I have your blessing? That was before that happened, right? That you got the cease and desist to. Well, no, I never had a I never I never had a conversation with them. No. Yeah. Well, so the cease and desist letter happened in, in September. I don't know what the question is. I'm, I'm saying the, the chance to ask, you said I didn't want to hand out, especially after this, but the opportunity to say, do you want to invest in my hedge fund? You could have, you could have done that before when you were leaving, which was, which was before the cease and desist letter in September. Uh, yeah, I could have had the opportunity that I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't. Well, yes. the, well, hold on. The cease and desist letter happened in September. Yes. So I, I, I don't understand. I'm saying that you left in August and mm-hmm. presumably you, you would ask for the blessing, but before you leave and you attend your official no, resignation. No, not necessarily. No, not okay. necessarily. No, because I needed to wrap up a couple things internally. And yeah. so I didn't, I was, I was finalizing some things. I had to wrap up some things internally that I, I can't obviously discuss about what mm-hmm. I was working on at the time. I wrapped those things up. And then usually how these discussions go is that once you've finished everything up and you're wrapping up your employment and that's final, then you have a discussion. And so when I saw that letter, I wanted nothing to do with them. And again, I was mindful of the fact that this was something that internally there was no precedent for investing in a macro fund. Um, I'll give you another example, Jack. I was recently told by a well-known investor that I, they could connect me with a fund of fund that would invest in hedge funds run by minorities, whatever that means. Uh, my mm-hmm. mom's Colombian. I guess I'm Hispanic. I don't really think about my race all that often. And mm-hmm. I said, heck no. Heck no. I don't want a penny unless you're investing on merit. I don't want a handout from my former boss, and I don't want some affirmative action wrapped up as a hedge fund check invested in Azoria. Every penny I earn that comes into the fund, I want it to be because someone believes in our framework and our approach to investing, and that alone. That extends to David. That extends to this DEI person who wanted me to invest on the basis of being Latinx or something. Got it. Did you, did you tell Greenlight that you were going to launch your own fund? Yeah, I've already answered that. Yeah, I've, I've told him I was going to launch my own hedge fund. When you, when you left? Yes. Okay, okay. Interesting. How did they react? Uh, I, I didn't speak to them on the phone. It was, it was an email. They didn't say anything either way. Uh, what's their reaction is judged by what they've done over the last eight to nine months, which is send cease and desist letters to me, threaten things baselessly and not actually sue me, and then send those same cease and desist letters to university, to a podcast, to a conference saying, take all this content down. Last time I checked, Jack, we have a first amendment in this country. I think it's hanging by a thread, but we have a first amendment in this country for a billionaire to go to a public university and to demand that that public university censor take down content that from a student org is a flagrant violation of the First Amendment. That public university is taxpayer funded. It is bound by the First Amendment. They have absolutely no right to take cues from a billionaire and censor protected speech. And so you you ask me, well, how did they take it? Well, we see how they're taking it. They're attacking Mm -hmm. me. They're going after me. And to tell you the truth, I can handle it. But this is just wrong. 
And can you talk about the political differences between you and David Einhorn? I believe I don't. I'm sorry, I don't have the quote in front of me, but that you know, you said David Einhorn was liberal, and that you were more on the conservative side. Can you tell us about that. Yeah, it, look, David Einhorn's politics are well known. My politics are, are well known. Uh, like most spirited people in the United States, we're allowed to have disagreements. Uh, I can't, you know, I'm I'm not going to divulge my private conversations. Um, he was certainly not a fan of President Trump. I've been a staunch defender of, of President Trump and what he's going to do, hopefully, if he gets a second term here. Uh, fortunate enough to spend some time with Vivek advising him on his campaign and traveling Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, seeing men and women of all walks of life who are frustrated with what's happening in this economy under Bidenomics. And uh, that those are my politics. And so I, I think that, you know, to some extent, if there was any catalyst, me going out and writing in the free press, as I did in the in May and June of 2023, about it's the censoring of conservatives in high school debate that certainly ruffled some feathers when I went on Fox News and, and Newsmax and talked about a, a young lady from Broward County where I grew up who was told at a high school debate tournament that she was not allowed to bring up President Trump in a speech about President Biden's foreign policy. Certainly, uh, that was not well received at Greenlight. And how did you know that? Did you, you heard it from people, oh, so-and-so is, isn't pleased or it was just a vibe you got? Oh, I, I was told. I was told directly. You were told yeah. uh, directly. And do you think that those political differences contributed to your departure? I, I think that they certainly didn't help. And, you know, there's, there's this general thinking that you have to separate politics from investing. If you let your views on any particular candidate cloud, and we saw that, by the way, Jack, I'm sure you'll remember going into the 2016 election uh, when the markets went limit down in the S&P futures the night of mm -hmm. the election. I remember. And everyone was like, Trump is the worst thing to happen. And in 12 hours, the market's up three or 4%. And so it's because people associated their politics of one man with an investment strategy. And you can never do that. You know, you're, 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 this is run forward guidance. So let's talk about forward guidance for a second. Don't confuse what you think the Fed should do. Yes. with what the Fed will do. Don't confuse your views on President Trump with the economic and financial realities of a second Trump term. I've talked about this publicly, by the way. I'm, I'm calling it the Trump acronym, T. Uh, let's call it tax cuts. R, regulation rollback. U, unilateral trade policy. M, the migration, the curbing thereof. And P, power projection. There are very obvious and not so obvious implications of what a Trump term would look like. And in, if anyone is working anywhere and has a fundamental disagreement about Donald Trump, and that person is not I don't think viewing things necessarily in the most rational way, and I'm not talking about anybody in particular, I'm just saying, if, if you and whomever were starting a fund and they had a view of any particular politician that was not rooted in truth and rooted in, you can have disagreements about the guy, you can call him the orange man, you can laugh at his tweets, but he was a game changer for the economy. So I agree with uh, the, what I think I think you're saying is that if you invest primarily on your political beliefs as an investor, you're going to get crushed. If you're a liberal and you don't buy oil stocks because of your political beliefs, that's bad. Not you know, and like if you're a conservative and you don't buy clean energy stocks, I just think yeah, th it's a recipe for for bad performance. Would you say that that politics motivating in investment style was prevalent at, at Greenlight or not? I, I don't. I don't want to comment either way on this. I, I. I would say that it is prevalent in our industry, Jack. You see what George Soros did going into the election, the losses that he sustained as well. Obviously, someone who suffers from very severe Trump derangement syndrome and one George Soros. And so, I, I commend people who are able to look at the facts, even if they aren't going to vote a certain way in November that they are able to look at the situation objectively. In the same way, I have uh, very little tolerance for the people who have been yelling about the Fed this and the Fed lat for the last 15 years and buying gold and buying gold call options and them expiring worthless. You have to look at the situation objectively. I have very serious disagreements about what Chair Powell did. Inflation broke 5% in June of 2021, and he didn't hike rates until March of 2022. I don't care about forward guidance. I don't care about the path sequencing of QE. That is wrong. That was a mistake. But at the end of the day, 
I can disagree with him and not take a position that is going to lose money. And the same thing carries over in politics. Look at Malay. If you looked at Javier Malay, I actually had the chance, I'm a fluent Spanish speaker, I had the chance to translate uh, between Vivek and President Malay backstage at at an event a couple months ago. And if you looked at Malay and you're like, wow, this guy has a chainsaw and he keeps saying carajo, which is a, a curse word in Spanish, and he's kind of a little funny looking, I'm not going to invest there. That would have been to your detriment, especially if you thought about going the other way, which is shorting. And then you have mm-hmm. someone like Druckenmiller who says, mm-hmm. I like what this guy has to say. He rejects the World Economic Forum. It rejects that type of state-run economy and embraces the beauty of libertarian capitalism and laissez-faire markets. Were there other people at Greenlight who were Republicans? I don't know anyone's voting record. Uh, I know that it was a firm that was based in Midtown East of New York City. Uh, you can look publicly at some of the people that David Einhorn supported. Uh, again, this is not about uh, differences in political opinion. Mm-hmm. This is about, to the extent that it matters, to what extent are you letting those political differences influence your investing process coming into an election year in particular? Um, that is, in, and I'm not speaking about any case in particular, but that is how it would matter, Jack. It's, I, I have tons of friends who are Democrats. Um, it's their ability to separate their personal politics from their investing. That's what ultimately matters. David Einhorn, I believe he is a supporter of something called the Einhorn Collaborative and the New Pluralists, which sounds like it's something which is trying to get people to not be closed-minded and bring people on all sides of the aisle together. So that doesn't sound like something that's incredibly partisan if someone is found in something to, to new partisan, at least to me, but perhaps you, you know differently. I, I, I would probably know a little bit better, Jack, to tell you the truth since I, 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 I don't doubt that you know, have more information. <laughs> I, of course you do. No, no, I understand. And look, I, I don't, I don't want to comment on David's charitable work. I think he's done great work uh, in that space. And I don't necessarily know these organizations well enough. And again, I'm not commenting on his political investing process at all. I want to be very clear about mm-hmm. that. What I am saying is folks who confuse their political beliefs with their investment process are doomed. I don't think I'll disagree with that. Now, as promised, let's talk about your investment views and your macro views. Thank you for- Wow, that, did, that couldn't come soon enough. <laughs> um, what, are you, what are you thinking right now in, in terms of stocks, bonds, the Fed? What are, you, what are your views? So I've had this framework for thinking about the Fed, which is, I've called it the lemon head problem. Uh, the Fed has a lemon head problem. And what do I mean by the Fed has a lemonhead? I'm not calling them lemonheads, although there's certainly evidence to suggest that, that many of them are, given how they conducted themselves in the post-pandemic era of monetary policy. We are living in a higher R-star world. The neutral rate is much higher than the Fed appreciates, than the market appreciates. And so what that means is Fed policy is not as restrictive as everyone thinks it is. And why do I call it lemonhead? Those lemonhead, have you ever had lemonhead candy, by the way, Jack? I have. Okay. Uh, well, you put them in your mouth. First thing you is sour. That's sour. Mm-hmm. Then you get sweet. And so the perception is it's a sour candy, but it's actually a sweet candy. The perception was that the fastest rate hiking cycle since the era of a guy named Paul Volcker was going to be bad for growth, was going to be massively disinflationary, and was going to be bad for risk assets. And we, we actually haven't seen that. And so Lemonhead, because it's been counterintuitive, you pop a Lemonhead, you expect it to be sour. It is at first. That was the stock market going down 18% mm-hmm. in 2022 in the, fact, in the face of the Fed funds rate going up at the rate that it did. But then it starts to sweeten up. And the reason it sweetens up is because the structure of the US economy has fundamentally changed. For the most part, we are an economy that our assets are floating and our liabilities are fixed. The 30-year fixed rate mortgage is uniquely an American phenomenon. Don't yes. find those in the UK. Sure as heck, don't find those in Eastern Europe or South America. And so when people were clamoring about 8% mortgage rates, I was looking at the data on Bloomberg. The average effective outstanding mortgage rate was 3.6%. Fed funds could have gone to 15 or 12%, Jack, and people would still have been paying, on average, 3.6% on their mortgages. And so that represents about 80% of household liability is the mortgage. And so when you have folks who are paying not more for this increase in rates and are actually being rewarded through the fixed income channel, you have 
consumer deposits, you have this insane excess savings that we're now not compounding at zero, but we're compounding at four or 5%. If you go to Robinhood.com right now, you will see the word earn interest before you see the word crypto. That would have been unheard of during the crypto mania just a couple of years ago. And so that's because investors are actually earning interest for the first time in a long time. I don't mean today. I mean, over the last mm. year and a half or so. And so let's think about the breakdown here for a second, Jack. If your liabilities are fixed, which means if rates go higher, you are not paying more in interest expense. And as rates go higher, you're actually earning more on the excess cash balances, most, a lot of which was tied to the enormous transfer payments under both under the CARES Act, under the COVID Appropriations Act, and of course, under the American Rescue Plan, the last of which was particularly ill-timed in the face of what was happening in the economy and the pandemic. Then guess what? The economy doesn't actually operate the way you think it does. Rates going higher up to a certain point isn't actually going to slow growth. It's going to do the opposite. So interest rates going up, the, the liabilities are fixed. So the 3%, 4% mortgages that uh, homeowners got in uh, 2020 and 2021, or the incredibly long duration fixed rate, you know, Amazon issuing a 40 year bond that's, you know, only a small, tiny amount above treasuries in terms of the yield. Sure. The private sector has huge fixed liabilities. So the rise in interest rate isn't going to immediately affect them. It's going to take a few years. Got it. That's exactly right. Yes. And that was not widely appreciated in 2022. And I think, you know, now objectively, it, it definitely is more true than the consensus thought it was because we did not have an imminent recession as was the consensus. I repeat, and you know, long-term viewers will know there was a headline from Bloomberg economics that said a 99% chance of a recession. Uh, mm -hmm. And that that's a pretty high percentage, and you know we have not had one yet. It is uh, you know, a, a year and a half later. Um, but James, on the on the fixed um, on the asset side, floating rate liabilities. You, you have a bank account, you have a money market fund. You used to mm -hmm. get zero, now you get five and a half percent. How stimulative do you think that really is? Because isn't it true that people who, to you know the average asset in a money market account or bank deposit is a corporation or a very wealthy individual? whose spending habits are not going to be wildly impacted by earning a little bit more income, as opposed to giving, you know, sending checks to average citizens who are going to spend that money. So the, the, the truth is both, right? You had transfer payments in that first part, call it again, 2020 and 2021 of the pandemic. That, that lit the foundation for this to even be a possibility. Those were obviously inflationary. I mean, think about this, the CARES Act, through that supplemental unemployment top off, you had two out of three workers in America making more on unemployment than they were at work. Obviously, the pandemic was a part of that, right? But why extend those conditions through the American Rescue Plan? Yes, at a lower amount, but why extend those types of conditions? Let's think about that, Jack. That's a massive negative labor shock. You're taking labor out of the market right? Because now they're making more sitting at home, ordering DoorDash and Chipotle. Shout out to Bill Ackman. And on the other side, you're giving them this ability, this cash to then spend money while there's a third option, a third category, which is, oh, wait, we're, we're lending, speaking of that word loan forbearance, we're giving them loan forbearance mm -hmm. and, and giving them the ability not to pay back their student loan debts. In some cases, private companies are giving loan forbearance on mortgages and so on and so forth. Obviously, there was a rent moratorium and eviction moratorium. And so these, thing, these three things conspired in a way that ultimately lived up to that fun maxim, which is too much money chasing too few goods and too much money chasing too few workers. And that was really what started this. But I want to be clear, I'm not saying this is inflationary. I'm not saying this is some massive boon to growth. But the idea was if you take Fed funds from zero in March of 22 to five and a quarter, you would think that you wouldn't end up adding 3 million jobs to the US economy in 2023. You wouldn't get blowout back-to-back -back retail sales numbers. The consumer is 70% of the economy in the United States, not the case in China where it's about 55%. And so if you're going to tell me, Jack, that the US is going to be in a 99% chance of a recession, my question to folks who were saying that in 21 and 22 was, why? And they kept going back to this, well, rates this and rates that, and it's going to squeeze the consumer. But I kept 
pushing them on the exact mechanics behind why rate hikes were going to hurt the consumer. We know they're not going to hurt businesses because as you brought up, Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, they all termed out their debt. We saw record issuance in 2021 and 2020 that allowed folks to lock in the low interest rates that were fueled by zero interest rates, the forward guidance path tied to that new shift uh, from the Fed at at, uh, Jackson Hole in August of 2020. And of course, QE, they took advantage of low rates on the company side. Funny enough, by the way, there are companies who are making more today in interest because of high rates then they're paying out an interest expense. So on a net basis. Um, And this is not just a unique company phenomenon. Obviously, this is going to be weighted toward the larger companies. But if you look at the Bureau of Economic Analysis, net interest payments by non-financial corporates in America have fallen for six quarters straight. They're down 25%. And so everyone had this idea that, wait, wait on a second. We're going to raise interest rates to get companies to invest less, to hire less. Oh, wait, we're we're giving them more money because they turned out their debt. They're locked in at a fixed rate, and they're actually now earning 4 to 5% on their excess cash. Uh, Okay, so that's not exactly working the way that the Greg Mankiw uh, macro textbook said it was going to. And then on the other hand, Jack, we say, hold on, consumers. Oh, yeah, well, they also refied their debt, uh, their household debt, at a record rate. And they're earning money on their cash. So where exactly was this going to happen? Where exactly were we going to have recession? There's an interesting stat here, household debt service payments as a percentage of disposable income. The long run average going back 40 years is 11.5%. Right here, right now, it's 97 So we're actually below the average of Household debt payments as a percentage of disposable income, despite the fact that the Fed just tightened monetary policy at the fastest rate since Paul Volcker. With the Fed has a lemonhead problem. They think that rate hikes are doing one thing and they're doing something entirely different. And so what does that mean? It doesn't mean you go cut rates counterintuitively, but it does mean you keep rates higher for longer. You know, when someone like Uh, Governor Waller was saying in the fall of last year, we're going to be cutting rates in the spring. He certainly walked that back big time. When you look at what the market was pricing after the December FOMC meeting going into January, six, seven rate cuts Uh in 2023, that's certainly been walked back big time. So the market's coming around to this. And so one thing that what has really been a, a guiding framework for me in in trading you know the front end of the interest rate futures curve whether it's trading fx whatever it may be has been guided by this this research this framework that the fed policy today is not anywhere near restrictive as they think it is and what that means is higher for longer i just want to be clear so you- there's one case that says because of all the what the reasons you said fixed liabilities floating rates that higher interest rates are nowhere near as contractionary as many market participants thought in 2022. That is the kind of the uh, soft version. The more extreme version would be say, actually interest rate hikes, not only are they less contractionary than people thought, they're actually net on net stimulative. Which camp are you in? I'm in the latter camp. I'm looking at the math. I'm looking at the math. I want someone, I want someone to find me 10 people who are going to stand up and say that and again, we're talking about obviously there's some there's some distributional impacts here, but you know, obviously who spends the money in the economy matters. There are obviously Americans who are suffering because of high inflation, who are living paycheck to paycheck and paying rent. But I look around, I look at people in my life, people in my community, and where is the proof that the Fed's rate hikes have hurt them? They're earning money on their Robinhood balances in their Chase CD accounts, four and a half, five percent. They're locked into a 2.7% mortgage rate. I'm not sure. I think Bidenomics is hurting them far more than, than Fed policy is today. Obviously, there are low-income Americans who are hurting, but they're not necessarily hurting because of the Fed policy today. They're hurting because of the mistakes that got us to this point, i.e., again, the Fed we had CPI hit 5% in June of 21. It took the Fed nine months to actually do something about it. That's a problem. And so, no, to tell you the truth, the people that I know, and you know, I'm not, you're not, I don't know, but I want to ask you, Jack, has your life been negatively affected by the Fed raising interest rates by zero to, from zero to 5%? 
No, but I haven't, since the Federal Reserve raised interest rates from zero to 5.3%, I haven't tried to buy a car or a home. Uh, mm -hmm. If I had to at the beginning, before the Fed started hiking rates, I could get a mortgage at 3 or 4%. I could get a car loan at maybe 5%. Now sure. I get a mortgage at 7%, 7 or 8%, and a car loan at 9 10 or 11%. That does matter. Eventually, you have to pay the piper and all this debt has to be refinanced. Just because it's longer than two years doesn't mean that it, you know, the, the debt is permanent, right? Oh, of course it doesn't. And, and remember, in the long run, we're all debt, right? So, but, but again, we're talking about what Fed policy is going to look like between now and 2024, at uh, the end of this year or going into 2025, right? And so to your point, by the way, uh, the, the fact that you haven't had to buy a car or, or do a mortgage that's also an issue here because all of that was front loaded because of the pandemic. People yes. took advantage of low mortgage rates either to buy outright or to refi. They took advantage of low interest rates to buy a car. And so all of that consumption was front loaded, the interest rate sensitive consumption, which left the non interest rate sensitive consumption, which by the way, is most of it because you don't need to finance the ability to go to dinner, get a haircut or go to Disney. That is what we're talking about here. And so, yeah, in the long run, this is going to have to be reconciled. But right here, right now, Jack, there is very limited evidence that interest rates are being restrictive and are actually holding down the economy. Far more evidence is on the regulatory side, on the inflation side, uh, but that is beyond the Fed's purview right here, right now, especially on the regulatory side. So it sounds like you're definitely not in the recession camp. Are you in the no landing camp or the soft landing camp over a short time horizon, three, six, 12 months, you choose. So I want to be clear. I, I, I think the economy is not working for most Americans, but there's a definition, you know, the way the Fed looks at the economy and the way that most Americans look at the economy. And so the Fed can look at the economy and say, everything is dandy. And by the metrics and by the dashboard that we use, we don't have to adjust policy or cut rates. When I actually look at the real economy itself, there's not a lot to be optimistic about. Let's talk about labor force participation, Jack. Since July of last year, we have lost 500,000 workers, native-born workers in the labor force, and we've gained 2 million foreign-born workers in the labor force. And so when you look at these monthly non-farm payroll numbers, the jobs report, what you're actually seeing in many cases is foreign workers many of whom are crossing the border and being given instant asylum, taking jobs. You see them in New York, you see them in California, and taking jobs and filling those responsibilities. Uh, you know, they are not the, the constituencies. They are not voting. They are not uh, what we think of as the U.S. economy, someone who just came here from, from Bangladesh or from uh, Guatemala or Nicaragua or Venezuela. So that's the first thing. Uh, is the labor market is largely right now being driven by migrant labor crossing the southern border. And so when you look at these gains, they're not actually telling you the full picture. The second thing is let's not confuse consumption with satisfaction. Americans are deeply dissatisfied about where things are right now. They're not happy about paying more at the grocery store. They don't appreciate the gaslighting from the Biden administration about, well, since inflation hasn't gone up any more, that you're in a good position. Meanwhile, things are across the board, 20 to 30% more expensive with no signs for that coming down anytime soon. And so that's not any solace. And then I look at the things that matter, which is rural America. I look at opioid overdose deaths. I look at deaths of despair. All of these things are at record highs. We're losing 950 people, Jack, to deaths of despair in this country. What does that mean? It means suicide. It means alcohol poisoning. It means overdose. And so I'm not trying to solve for some GDP output on what we mean by the economy being good or not being in recession. That is meaningless. What matters is the American people. And when I look at somebody like the late Alan Kruger, the economist from Princeton who sadly took his own life several years ago, his hallmark research finding was that half of the working age men who were not working were taking opioid painkillers every single day. And so I don't want anyone, not least that press secretary from the White House, lecturing the, the people of this country about how great the economy is when we've got half of working age men not working in places like Appalachia, in places like Southern Alabama and Northern Mississippi, not working and being told by Will Stansel that the economy is great 
and you're the one who needs to reevaluate it and go get a Bloomberg account and look at all these metrics. The economy and the American people are deeply hurting just because the official statistics, and I'm not suggesting that they're rigged, I'm saying that they are measuring something different. I care about the well-being, the, uh, let's call it the, the livelihood, the, the quality of living of the people of this country, not the people who just got here uh, three weeks ago from mainland China on some BS asylum claim. I care about them. And so in that case, the economy is not working. But again, let's go back to separating your politics and mm-hmm, your ability yeah. to assess up. Which, this is a purely political situation. This has yes. little to no bearing on what the Federal Reserve is going to do at the June or the July meeting or what the dots are going to look like in September. But it does have very real implications for the election. And I think that's why President Trump is going to take this thing in a landslide. Got it. So you would agree that everything you just said is political. And so it, and I don't mean to insult you, but it has uh, zero alpha, neither positive nor negative because it's not, does not impact the market. You would agree that the short term interest rate uh, uh, construct uh, futures market does not trade on what you just talked about. It trades on the unemployment rate, the non farm payrolls, the stock markets trades on earnings, uh, interest rates, economic the labor market uh, uh, spending data such as that, everything you talked about is very important, but would you agree that it doesn't impact key macro assets, stocks and bonds? No, but it does impact men, women, children, communities, which are really badly hurting right now. And so I am a, I am a Christian first, I am an American second, I am a conservative third, and I am a head of macro fourth, allegedly. Um, So uh, honestly, this is all interesting, but what I care about is what happens to this country. I I view my ability to make money in the markets as an ability to use those resources to fund my nonprofit, Incubate Debate, which is now the fastest growing debate league in America. We're serving 5,000 students in rural and urban communities from all walks of life uh, to participate in this thing called open debate. that is what matters to me. But you're absolutely right. These are, I don't call them political observations. They're, they're yeah. reality observations, Jack. But the market is not real life. It is not reality. It is in many ways a game. And the lack of rational thinking in the market creates interesting opportunities. This obsession with Trump derangement syndrome, which a lot of hedge fund managers suffer from, led to steep losses around the 2016 election, I think will lead to steep losses again in this election. That's why I'm building out this Trump framework aptly named, I think, to think about what a second Trump term will do for financial markets. What do you think a second Trump term will do if he is elected, will do for financial markets? Well, so it's, I mean, this is a really long conversation. I think the biggest thing we're going to look at in all of this is I don't, I don't try to do this predictive scenario analysis game. I, I don't want to make big predictions. I want to look at what has happened in the past and get a better idea for what's going to happen in the future. And so I don't want to compare Biden's plan versus Trump's plan. I want to see what happened under the first Trump term that is going to then again happen under the second term. Second term, And again, there's going to be shades to that. There's going to be nuance to that. I recently had a conversation with Bob Lighthizer over lunch about what trade policy was going to look like. It was very informative. And what I would say, the biggest thing for investors of all shapes and sizes to think about is what trade policy is going to look like. Because this has been Donald Trump's biggest agenda item. Go back to the 1980s when he was running full page ads in the New York Times about how Japan is ripping us off. He views trade policy as the ultimate tool to right the wrongs of globalization. And make no mistake, there are wrongs of globalization. I'm not falling for that World Economic Forum nonsense. There are wrongs of globalization. And so if you view trade policy, if you view, well, what are we trying to solve for here? If you want the solution, the outcome that you're solving for, Jack, to be the cheapest possible t-shirts and air fryers, then yes, China ripping us off, taking our IP, sending stuff over to Mexico and shipping it across the border with some very lovely people is not good for the American economy, but is good for lower prices. Instead, the Trump Lighthizer view is let's not solve for price. Let's solve for dignity. Let's solve for respect. Let's solve for the amount of men who are working age but are not in the labor force and working because they're taking painkillers every day. That trade policy is the right one. And I want to be clear here. This is not tariffs forever and ever. This is tariffs as a means to an end, as a means to rebalancing trade to actually make the playing field level. And so the second 
other countries stop cheating and stop rigging this bilateral, multilateral trade system, that's the moment that we can take these tariffs off. And in the meantime, there's going to have to be some interesting conversations. Again, negotiations uh, between the U.S. Trade Representative, who I hope again will be Bob Lighthizer, and of course, uh, President Trump's team. Trade policy is the most important. It also, Jack, happens to be the one that's largely within the authority of the president of the United States without having to go to Congress. And so these are largely executive actions. We saw that again with what happened with Mexico in 2019, with what happened with the phase one trade deal. These things did not require congressional approval. Obviously, USMCA did uh, require ratification, but a lot of the tit for tat stuff that was used in negotiations was straight from the White House. So you don't have what some would say is the moderating effect from Congress, which to tell you the truth, a lot of Republicans are Democrats when it comes to this free trade. They, they fall for that line Hook, they, they fall for it without ever questioning it. Free trade is good, tariffs are bad. Free trade is good, tariffs are bad. Much like the folks who said interest rates are bad, they are going to hurt the economy. Interest rates are bad, they're going to hurt the economy without actually ever thinking for themselves. Think for yourself and you'll realize that the trade agenda that President Trump is going to pursue is going to uh, really revive growth and bring high quality jobs back to the United States, not the jobs where you're working here and you're working there and you're, you're doing doubles and then you're off and this, that, and the other. Those are not the jobs that respect the dignity of the American worker. And so how is that going to impact financial markets? If tariffs, a Trump, under a Trump presidency, tariffs would be higher than under a Biden presidency. How is that impacting markets? Well, obviously, there are clear implications for what's going to happen in the foreign exchange market. That's the clear release valve for trade negotiations. And so you have to very closely monitor what's going to happen in CNH, what's going to happen in dollar mex, for example, what's going to happen with the euro. As these things are moving in real time, as trade negotiations are going to happen, as tariffs are going on, that's obviously stronger dollar and that's weaker the currency that is being applied the tariffs. And so there's a lot to do there. A lot of it is in the moment. You can't put a trade on in, on May 22nd, anticipating what's going to happen. But it's really about having the right framework and understanding what the implications of these, of these trade policies will be. Got it. Right now, are you, what are you more bullish on? Which you, which you like more, stocks or bonds and why? So, you know, I don't really think about it that way, to tell you the truth. I think about the market in terms of scenarios. What is the Fed going to do? What impact is that going to have? I think there's very little impact, by the way, between what the Fed does uh, and and what the stock market does. I mean, again, the, the market's up 25% since the Fed, the first Fed rate hike. Um, we've had just continued outperformance. You know, the market sells off for two minutes after a Fed meeting and then has rallied back to all-time highs just uh, days later. And so there's very little correlation between what the Fed is doing at any given moment and what the market's doing. And part of that goes back to the lemonhead problem that the Fed has right now is there's very little in terms of transmission between Fed policy and the real economy and, of course, the stock market, right? If if Fed rate hikes aren't hurting businesses, uh, which are disproportionate, large businesses which are disproportionately uh, weighted in the S and P 500, then there's obviously not any impact there. Now, look, look at Russell 2000 versus S and P. The, the divergence that you see there, Jack, is precisely because the Russell companies have mm -hmm. higher exposure to to interest rates, uh, to floating rate debt, and so on. Um, but I would say this: there are three key areas that I'm looking at. One of them is this higher for longer theme, which is tradable in a number of ways. I think dollar yen is a really interesting way to trade it because you have this positive carry element. You know, dollar yen right now, if you go on your Bloomberg and look at your screen, it's 156. But if you go out three months, you're not actually buying it at 156. You're buying it at 154. If you go out six months, you're buying it at 152. If you go out a year, you're buying it at 148. And that's because the forward curve... Mm -hmm rewards you for buying the dollar selling the yen because Japanese interest rates are zero and US interest rates are five and a quarter. And so you get to have the right macro view, which is that the dollar will continue to appreciate, but you get to have it at a nice little discount because the market is rewarding you with that positive carry. Now, I take that a step further and I say, look, how can we juice that up a little bit? One, to limit the downside in the event that something happens for the BAJ. I don't expect them to embark on some Fed style or ECB style hiking cycle. And a lot of people are uh, wrong about that with that, uh, that prediction. But I look at that and I say, just if, if dollar yen is 156, you can buy a 155 
digital call that is technically in the money to spot, but out of the money to the forward. And as essentially, if nothing happens, if we're just in the same spot, and I don't mean like a straddle, I mean, if dollar yen is higher than 155, you can pay something like 35 cents for that and make a dollar. And so that's when I, when I think about macro, I think about the, the quote that someone told me very early on when I started, which was the, the way you structure the bet, Jack, is often more important than the bet itself. Anyone can have any idea about Japan this, about gold that, about inflation this, but how you structure that bet matters. Look, in March of 2020, when that $2 trillion CARES Act came down the pike, it was very clear that was going to be inflationary in a way that post-08 fiscal stimulus wasn't. It was literally helicopter money from PPP to the top off unemployment benefits to the stimulus checks. It was just handing money out in many cases to Americans of the lowest income variety who had the highest propensity to consume, who Mm -hmm. were then being taken out of the labor market, which was doubly inflationary, who were then being absolved of their of their liabilities in the moment, which was also inflationary. And so you could have looked at that and said, holy moly, this is going to lead to an unbelievable inflation rate. What was gold in March of 2020? It was 1,600. What was gold at the end of 2022? 1,600. And yeah, there was a little bit up and a little bit down. But what you're far better off doing in my framework of looking at, and a lot of people share this framework, is... Do the thing that works, that is simple, that is predictable, that doesn't require you to take this basis correlation risk in, 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 in mind. So instead of buying gold on the basis of inflation, don't confuse the view with the structure. Mm-hmm. You just pay a two-year inflation swap. A two-year inflation swap in March of 2020 was negative 20 basis points. What that was saying is the market believe not that inflation was going to be a certain number, but that deflation was a certainty over that period that it was going to average negative 20 basis points. And three months later, that shot up to 1.8%. And in the, in the traditional style of investing, you look at that and say, take your profits or trim it. When I look at that, I say, add, 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 because now you actually have more conviction about what's going to happen because you're seeing it play out in real time. And the cool thing about an inflation swap or a variant swap or a volatile, whatever it is, like a Fed funds futures contract, it settles into some objective terminal outcome, unlike gold. If you buy gold on the basis of inflation being higher than expected, Jack, you've got to then find somebody in six months who's willing to buy it from you at a higher level. If you pay an inflation swap, you are exchanging what you view or what the market's view of inflation is today over some period of time with what inflation actually is over that period of time. And so that is why this type of trading framework, I, I think, is makes a lot of sense. It's simple, it's predictable, it is liquid, it is scalable, and it applies obviously to inflation, to variant swaps. If you sell a variant swap at 30 vol and realize it ends up being 15, then you know you made your money. That's not the case with the VIX, not technically anyway, right? Because it's a, it's a function of realized vol. The cool thing about these instruments too is that they, they de-risk and they auto-monetize with time. So if you put on a two-year inflation swap in March of 2020, every inflation print that happens takes profit and takes risk off the table. And so you could literally just sit back, put this trade on, and not touch it for two years. Whereas with gold, you would have had to time it. Yes, gold went from 1600 to 2000. Yes, it was up over that two year period, but it ended 2022 at 1600. And so you'd have had to have been right on the timing, on the direction, on the path dependency, and on the view. When you're just have the view, and you can express that in a simple, predictable instrument that settles into a terminal outcome, that is the way to trade macro, in my opinion. So I think you're absolutely right that being right and making money are two different things. And it often is how you express the trade. And specifically, do you have a, a stop loss and you know to, to limit your losses and, and maximize your gains? So just to review, you do like uh, dollar yen, be, you know, being long the dollar uh, over the yen, and in the future, taking advantage of, of the positive carry of the dollar, the fact that dollar interest rates are higher than the yen. And you, you mentioned higher for longer. So presumably that means you think that the Fed is not going to cut by as much as the market expects. Um, do you have a view on the stock market in any possible, whether it's, you know, S&P calls, S&P puts, volatility, and the front end is compressed. Any any view in stocks at all or, or no? Yeah, I do. I, I, do. I think that the, the biggest 
thing to look at in, in the market today is the entrenched players who are already generating value from generative AI. And what do I mean by that? I mean companies like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, who are who benefit from AI in a number of ways, right? You look at the ability to actually build out the infrastructure, look at something like Azure or Google Cloud, obviously AWS, those are all checked boxes on being able to monetize this AI, AI paradigm shift. Then you look at uh, with, with Microsoft, their ability to sell Copilot, to increase prices, to offer new offerings to people who are already entrenched and part of that Microsoft ecosystem. Again, billions of devices between these three companies. This is not a, a paradigm shift where you're going to see the entrance. Obviously, you're going to have examples like OpenAI, but again, the Microsoft relationship there is important. But this is not the world in which the, the, the sort of the stalwarts, the incumbents are going to be at a disadvantage. They're going to be at a tremendous advantage. You need capital to actually invest, to buy GPUs, to scale out this technology. You need an existing device ecosystem to deploy it to. They have that. And in many cases, they have consumer products. We just saw this new Surface laptop from Microsoft with this impressive AI GPU on board. That is in, in just three ways. Azure, Microsoft 365 via Copilot, and a consumer technology-facing product that is benefiting from AI. And you get that in a company that is that is compounded about 20% of year. I'm reminded of this Bill Ackman quote, which was, we buy hedges, not just because they're hedges, but because they make good investments on their own. And so let's just kind of take that and paraphrase it. I would want to buy companies not because they're AI companies in the sense that you look at an NVIDIA, for example, I think it's still a great company, but are strong, free cash flow generative companies. They have a moat, they have a strong management team, a strong balance sheet, and the AI kicker is there. Companies that, even if AI didn't exist, Jack, would be compounding at 15, 20, 25% a year for the next 10 years. The AI kicker is the embedded optionality. And so that's what I'm most excited about. There's some really interesting things you can do with long-term call options to, to reflect this view. Again, eliminating path dependency, not requiring a stop loss because you're pretty much buying options, I think, at a mispriced volatility level and, 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 and watching things reprice accordingly. And then I think holding some stuff in, in, uh, in the underlying stock itself. But I don't try to be too creative. You know, We're not here to find the next stock that's going to go up 10x. If you can find a handful of companies that are well entrenched, that have a moat, that have existing device ecosystems, that have the cash, that are not going to be subject to some geopolitical event that are, let's just give you an example, NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. If AI turns out to be a total fad, and we're not even talking about it, we're laughing about it two years mm -hmm. from now, NVIDIA is not going to do very well, is it, Jack? It's going to be down massively. No. Microsoft is not going to be down massively. Microsoft is a real business. Not to say that NVIDIA isn't, but Microsoft is a real business independent of the AI phenomenon in a way that NVIDIA isn't. So yes, are we probably going to see lower returns holding Microsoft over the next 10 years in NVIDIA? Probably, but with a stronger sense of stability, with less volatility, and with far more predictability. And just like with that dollar yen trade, if you can add that kicker on top, of a mispriced call option out to 2025 or 2026, you don't have to worry if there's some nuclear whatever or some event geopolitically that could take you out of a position that you need to risk manage. I'm a big fan of options. That's my really my background. What I bring to the table is a, is a derivatives background. And so if I can look at a stock today that is compounded at a consistent rate, and it seems like the business itself, if you look at the fundamentals, pop open the hood, understand exactly what what markets they have access to, and then you add this AI kicker, then, gee, that's a good deal. You said the thing about path dependency. Uh, aren't, don't, aren't options the things that have path dependency and holding the underlying asset doesn't? Like, for example, if you, a January 2026, 430 call, which is Microsoft closed today, for $430.52, if it didn't move at all from now until January 2026, it, and it, it expired worthless, and then the next day after it expired, it went to a thousand. You would be a victim of path dependency, right? Whereas if you just own the underlying, that wouldn't matter. I think we may mean different things by path dependency. What I mean by path dependency is if you own Microsoft and it goes down fifty percent, you've just lost half of your money or on that particular investment. If you have an option that's out to twenty twenty six and Microsoft goes down fifty percent, you haven't 
right? You haven't lost what you would have lost in, in, in the first scenario. The cool thing about options is that they naturally de-risk themselves, right? As you move closer to strike, you get longer the stock. As you move away from strike, you, you lose that long exposure. By path dependency, I also mean that you're not going to be taken out of a position because you're either direct and a, a explicit risk limit, say, hey, if Microsoft goes down 20%, I'm out, or because you have some kind of levered long that says at some point you have to get out because for margin requirements. And so that doesn't happen with options when you're long them, because as long as that stock, obviously this is kind of basic, as long as that stock is above that level, it doesn't matter if Microsoft traded down 50%. As long as you get to that level by 2026, you're in a good Position. And I'm not recommending the particular strike that you mentioned, uh -huh. but just as an example, yeah, yeah. obviously being short options comes with path dependency. The other way, you're, you're, you're buying the path dependency uh, benefit from those who are short the options. They're selling it to you. Got it. Do you have a view on the long end of the yield curve? 10 year, 30 year? Yeah, I think that, you know, in line with what I mentioned earlier about there being a higher neutral rate, that part of the curve needs to be repriced. I think we have to look to something that happened and this is not a theory, this actually happened, this is not a hypothetical scenario, is what happens when a liquid G7 government bond market stops functioning. We saw that in the UK in the fall of 2022. We went from, we went up 100 basis points on the 30-year gilt in just a matter of weeks. And so that was a function of the market testing fiscal policymakers in light of that new budget announcement in light of more reckless fiscal spending, something we continue to see in Washington, again, at a time of, as measured, low unemployment and still not low inflation. And that is a problem. And so I worry about, and because it can happen in the UK, it sure as heck, and it didn't happen in Zimbabwe, it didn't happen in Argentina. I mean, although, although it did, right? I mean, those, those things have happened. But I'm, for the purposes of this comparison, I'm talking about a liquid G7 market and what that would mean for the possibility of this happening here. And so long end yields higher for the, the higher for longer impact shift on the market. And then you obviously, I think, want to have the market needs to have a risk premium if this reckless fiscal spending, and it's both parties, I got to tell you, it's both parties, Jack, if that continues, the long end at current levels is just not reflective of the risks in the United States. Got it. So earlier I asked which do you prefer, stocks or bonds? And you said, I don't really think about that way. And you, uh, you know, politely declined to answer the question. But based on what you said, how you think AI is legit and you like Microsoft, for example, uh, you know, Microsoft is a big percentage of the S&P 500. Other companies which are similar to it, uh, you know, the Magnificent Seven, they're, they're a big percentage of the S&P 500. Sounds like you're somewhat optimistic on stocks. And you just said you, you're not in love with the long end. The long end could go up. So is it fair to say, uh, you know, sorry to ask a question that you already declined, that you are, I, I gather that you sounds like you're more bullish on stocks over bonds. Is that fair to say? Yes. It, the way you framed the question, though, was like I was an institutional investor, like a real money investor, like I have to, to put money in other. I can be involved in the bond market from the short side as a macro trader. And so when you say, you know, yeah, stocks or bonds, I'm involved in both. And yeah. um, that, that's how I think about it. And so if you're going to ask, which would I rather be long over the next 10 years? Obviously, stocks for the reasons uh, outlined, specifically those stocks that I mentioned. And I think there's interesting opportunities trading the bond market, but from a, a long you know, position, I think there's some interesting opportunities in, in real yields if you kind of get in around these levels uh, to lock in some low rates, uh, sorry, to lock in some higher uh, real mm -hmm. rates. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of a 10-year position, I would much rather be invested in stocks uh, than, than the bond market. But again, certainly op trading opportunities around what's happening in treasuries and interest rate futures. What is your investment, final question, your investment philosophy at Azoria? Uh, I mean, it sounds like you are involved in a lot with option structures and you can do everything, but is there anything about your investment philosophy that you have at Azoria or plan on having at Azoria that you don't think people will have gathered now by you know the, talking about markets so far? Yes, I think a lot of it has been, you know, I'm a big believer in don't tell people what your philosophy is or your framework, just show them. And I, I think that I've uh, outlined that and what's going on now a two, con two hour conversation. I, I would say, if I could sum it up, we don't make predictions, we assign probabilities. And I think I've made that clear with thinking about things like dollar yen. If, you, if you're predicting what dollar yen is going to do, you're going to be long dollar yen in size, and you're going to be exposed to path dependency risk, which is if we go down to 148, you're screwed, especially if you have a levered long. 
And so using options, taking advantage of the forward curve and how risk reversals are priced and how skew in the surface is priced helps with that. Um, so again, assign probabilities. And then I think build out a portfolio that does well in various states of the world, right? And that goes back to the assigning probabilities is, okay, what happens if Trump wins? What happens if Biden wins? What happens if AI is a real magical thing, and I think it is. And what happens if it's just a flop? If you build out a portfolio that is largely exposed to names like NVIDIA, and there's some probability that the state of the world is AI is a flop, then you're kind of screwed with that NVIDIA position. This Microsoft position, Jack, does far better in a wider range of states of the world than NVIDIA would, right? And I believe in the company. I'm invested in the company. But in terms of what company is going to behave better, is going to withstand volatility, is going to withstand the dispersion of different scenarios and outcomes, there's no question. It's just, it's Microsoft. There we go. James Fishback of Azoria. Thank you so much for coming on. And thanks everyone for listening. My pleasure, Jack. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash moatfg to learn more about the Vanek Morningstar Wide Moat ETF, ticker MOAT. Lastly, Forward Guidance is available not just on YouTube, but on all podcast apps. And a video version is available on Spotify and Twitter, where I post interviews regularly. Thanks again. Until next time.